Dalton, Arkansas is a small town inside Randolph County with an estimated population of 301 souls. It's a quiet community, kind of place where everyone knows each other's names and is always willing to help out, where people don't lock their doors at night and are unafraid to brandish weapons should the need arise. Dalton might almost seem to be the ideal place to live, to raise a family and watch their children grow, but there's a dark side to the town and the surrounding areas. Drugs, marijuana and methamphetamine swim through the streets and side roads like trout in a stream. Everyone knows it, but very few like to talk about it. In the early morning hours of July 30th, 1998, police received a phone call from a frantic woman asking them to go out to the home of her daughter, Lisa, and her husband, Carl Elliott. She had received a phone call stating that there was some sort of domestic disturbance taking place at the house, and concerned for her grandchildren as well as the well-being of her daughter. She decided to make a phone call. When the police arrived, the rain was coming down hard and heavy. And after knocking on the door, the officer decided to leave, seeing nothing amiss. It wouldn't be until the next day, when Lisa's stepmother attempted to leave her trailer and found that she could not because the door was blocked that the reality of the domestic disturbance that she had heard became apparent to all. This is the death cast, and these are the Elliott family murders. Hello, and welcome to the death cast. I'm your host, best-selling author, Ian Totten, and I'd like to thank you for joining me as we prepare to take a look at the Elliott family murders, which took place in 1998 in Dalton. Arkansas. Before we get into that, however, a couple show notes, normal plugs. If you would like to follow me on social media, that would be YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or MeWe. Just search for Ian Totten Author. If you'd like to be a part of the DeathCast community on Facebook, just go to my author page and search for groups. There is a DeathCast group associated with that page. Ask to join, I'll let you in, and you can come in and have some fun. We're constantly posting rather off-color memes and other various things. If you would like to follow me on Twitter, just search for Corpse Creek. If you want to keep abreast of everything that's going on in my world, go to CorpseCreekPublishing.com. Sign up for the mailing list. While there, consider making a donation which will help the show with its production costs by clicking on the Donate Now button. You can also find a link there to all of my books on Amazon. That's the Blood Gods Trilogy. The House of Silver Doors, and The Throwaway Girls of Olympia, which is soon to be released as an audiobook. Like the show and want to let others know about it? Leave a five-star review on your favorite podcast platform. Subscribe to the show, and as soon as a new episode is out, you will get a notification. Share it on social media, shout it from the heavens, let your friends know. Speaking of five-star reviews, we have a new one this week on Apple Podcast from MX Sandy 12 Fantastic pod, true crime, and so much more. Love it. Thank you, MX Sandy 12 Appreciate it greatly. If you are an advertiser and you are looking to advertise on a show for a reasonable fee, please contact me at ian at corpsecreekpublishing.com. That's ian at corpsecreekpublishing.com. I inquire about my rates and we'll get you on the air and you 
me be heard by thousands of listeners worldwide weekly. All right, now that that's out of the way, find yourself some place to sit, relax, grab a drink, close your eyes. I've got my coffee, I've got my cigarettes. Let's go into the crypt. As you heard in the trailer, we're going to be discussing the Elliott family murders, which took place somewhere between July 29th and the morning of July 30th, 1998, in the town of Dalton, which is in Randolph County, Arkansas, in the northeastern part of the state. Dalton is an extremely small hamlet. It really doesn't fall under the town or village terminology given to the sparsity of population. Uh, As of the last census, it was estimated that about 302 people lived in the county, and it's a very close-knit community. The Dalton household sat near the Eleven Point River. In this house, you had 27-year-old Lisa Elliott, who was kind of a heavy-set blonde woman with glasses. Her husband, 30-year-old Carl Elliott, who was a very thin man with, at least from the pictures I could find, your typical backwoods southerner look to him. He had the pencil-thin mustache and the, you know, big brown mullet going on. They also had two children, an eight-year-old daughter named Felicia and a seven-year-old named Gregory. This property had been in the family for a number of years. In fact, Lisa's father and her stepmother lived in a trailer on this property not far from the actual house. Now, from looking at pictures, it looks as though it was situated almost directly behind the house. And the reason given for this was that Lisa's father was mentally impaired while her stepmother was disabled and by them living in this trailer it could allow Lisa and her husband to keep an eye on the older couple while at the same time it allowed the grandparents to see their grandchildren. July 29th was an extremely hot day. In fact, that summer is noted for days on end with the temperature in excess of 100 degrees. Lisa contacted her mother, Mary Catrin, at some point during that day and asked if she could borrow a few dollars so that she could buy a new skirt claiming that she would pay it back the following day. Lisa's mother agreed to this, and Mary went over to her place of work, the Pocahontas Nursing Home. Pocahontas is the largest city in Randolph County, and is the county seat. The two women went shopping, and each of them bought a blouse as well as some clothes for Lisa's children, after which they went out and had lunch at a local Wendy's. And when they went to say their goodbyes, Lisa told her mother not to say goodbye, but to say, see you later. I really wasn't able to find much in the way of what her husband, Carl Elliott, was doing on that day. But it's more likely than not that he was either working as a carpenter, which he did from time to time in an effort to earn money, or he was at home with the children. 
Carl Elliott was known to friends and family to have a fairly violent temper, which really isn't surprising when you factor in that he was also addicted to crystal meth. Not only was he addicted to crystal meth, but many friends and family members have said in the years since that he was also involved in the selling of crystal meth and other drugs. So here you have this young couple and their two children. The father's hooked on drugs and he's selling them on the side. That evening, the on July 29th, Everything just seemed to be okay with the family. You know, they were settling down for the night when thunderstorms rolled in, bringing with it torrential downpours. At some point during that evening, a knock sounded on the Elliot's front door, and it was a friend of the Elliot's whose car had broken down, and as Carl was known to be something of a mechanic, he was asked to come down and give a hand. Not long after this is when Lisa's father and stepmother heard what they described as a domestic disturbance on the intercom that connected their two homes. Eventually, Lisa's stepmother, Virginia Miller, decided to call Lisa's mother, Mary, and let her know about the domestic disturbance that she had heard. Mary made repeated requests to Virginia to use the intercom to call the Elliott household, and initially Virginia refused but eventually she acquiesced, and when there was no answer, she called 911. This is an important detail here, because when the phone call went through, it was mistakenly transferred to the Clay County Sheriff's Department, which is an entirely different jurisdiction, and while that was going on, Mary herself called the Randolph County Sheriff's Department. Around 1 a.m., an officer drove to the house, and after observing that nothing seemed to be out of place, he left. There are conflicting stories about this particular welfare check. Some state that he simply pulled into the driveway, kind of looked around quickly, and then drove off, while others have it that he actually got out of the car and walked up to the door, knocking, and when there was no answer, decided to leave. So which version you believe is really up to you? I find it more likely than not that given the weather that evening, the officer drove through, saw lights on in the house, and decided that everything was okay. The night seemingly passed without any further disturbances, and the following morning, Mary called the Elliot household and again was unable to get any response. After this, she called Virginia Miller and asked her to go see what was going on. Virginia attempted to leave the trailer, but was unsuccessful because something was blocking the door. And upon looking out the window, she saw that her deck was covered in blood, and it was at this point that Virginia Miller contacted the police. Sheriff Rob Sammons arrived at the house at some point after this and saw that the Elliot's front door was slightly ajar. Upon walking inside, he found a house in complete disarray with lights flickering 
and the television still on. There was clothing strewn all throughout the house. And turning to his left, he found a boy lying on the ground. Checking on the boy, he saw that he had been savagely beaten and that his throat had been slit with a sharp object which basically ripped out his trachea. Going into the kitchen, he discovered that pretty much the entire kitchen was covered in blood. One description I read of it was that it almost looked as though a bag filled with dark red paint had exploded inside of the room. At this point, Salmon's left the home, obviously shaken by what he had seen, and after taking a few moments to collect his breath, he decided to make his way back towards the trailer, and along the way, he saw what it was that had been blocking the door. Lisa lay sprawled across the door, and it was obvious that she had been beaten severely. There was bloody handprints all over the outside of the door. And later, the medical examiner would state that she had been struck at least 27 times before having her throat slit. Carl and Felicia were nowhere to be seen. At this point, Police converged on the house, both state and local officials, and they found a bloody tire iron inside of Felicia's bedroom. Well, down by the river, they found Carl's 1984 Thunderbird, roughly a mile from the family's household. So the initial thought process of the police was that there had been some sort of fight between the mother and father and that Carl in a fit of rage had killed his son before beating his wife to death after which point she was able to crawl out of a window and he went after her slashing her throat which would explain the domestic disturbance that Lisa's father and stepmother heard coming over the intercom. Obviously, given the size of the town, this sent a shockwave throughout the entire community, and people began locking their doors, but more than that, they began checking up on each other because they didn't know where Carl was. And they thought that if he was capable of doing this to his own wife and child, what might he do to them if given the chance? However, people's perception on who had committed the crime changed on August 1st when Carl's bloated body was discovered floating in the 11 Point River. It seems that he had washed downstream somewhat and had actually ended up outside of Dalton itself. Upon examining the body, it was learned that Carl had been shot with a twenty-two caliber gun at least twice. How his body was discovered, I've seen multiple reports on that. Some state that A person driving spotted it from the road, while others that fishermen saw the body in the water underneath a bridge, and upon closer inspection, it was discovered to have been the body of a man. In any event, Carl was taken off of the list of suspects, obviously, and it was at this point that the police started to look around for further individuals who might have wanted to murder the family, and they really quickly settled on 
the Green family. The Greens were known to be involved in the local drug trade, particularly the methamphetamine trade. They were known to be a fairly violent group of individuals, and this started all the way back with the father named Billy Dale Green, who was born March 14, 1956. Now, Billy had an extremely lengthy rap sheet that included everything from assaults to terroristic threats and burglary. Apparently, and I couldn't find anything beyond stories told by locals, Billy was shot at some point in his younger days during a barroom brawl and nearly died. Obviously, he was able to survive, and he went on to marry a woman named Mary. September 19th of 1975, the couple had their first child, Chad Wayne Green. This was followed by at least one other son named Jason and a daughter. But from all accounts, Billy Green was your atypical tyrant when it came to his family with reports that he consistently mentally abused them all as well as beat them mercilessly. This includes his wife. Some individuals have stated that Billy was known to fire a gun at people when he was angry at them. At some point, Billy got involved in the methamphetamine trade and began cooking it himself. The Green Sons grew up to be much like their father. They were large, stocky men with a history of violence. Chad was known to have a predilection for young girls. They were just an all-around bad brood. Now how Carl Elliott comes into the picture is, if you'll remember, he was a known meth addict. And at some point, he became entwined in the green family business, which in and of itself was odd, as the Green family was known to be fairly closed off from people who were not relatives of theirs. For some reason, though, they took a liking to Carl and entwined him in what they were doing, you know, behind closed doors. So that eventually Carl began running drugs for them as well as buying from them. There are some reports out there that state that this really wasn't the case, that the Elliots and the Greens were not close. This was really pushed by the defense teams later on, but the reality is that The Green brothers were at the Elliott home on a daily basis, oftentimes multiple times a day, and Elliott was known to go to the Green households in a similar manner. During the summer of 1998, though, the extended family of the Elliots and the Greens began noticing a rift between Carl Elliott and Dale and Chad Green. In fact, some reports have it that there was an almost open hostility from the Greens toward the Elliott family. This is believed to stem from a drug debt that Carl owed them. And there's a number of different versions as to what this debt actually was. One theory is that Carl had gotten drugs from the Greens with the intention of selling them and in fact used them himself. 
Another is that he and another family member had stolen a number of marijuana plants from Dale Elliott. While still a further is that the plants were in fact stolen from Chad Elliott. In any event, it is known that at some point during that summer, Lisa Elliott attempted to borrow $10,000 from someone that the family knew because she had to repay a debt. This individual refused to lend Lisa the money as he probably likely knew what it was for. Any event, things became so heated between Carl and the Greens that Lisa's mother, Mary, begged her daughter to leave the area with the children because she feared what might happen. A request which Lisa refused. Somewhere around July 27th of 1998, Lisa and her son Gregory were near the doors of the Price Chopper grocery store in Pocahontas when Chad and Jason Green confronted them. One of the men reportedly grabbed Gregory's hand while the brothers began to speak with Lisa, letting her know that they needed to talk with Carl. A witness later recounted that she was walking by when she saw this scene unfold and she went over to Lisa to ask her if she needed any help and was told quote unquote to keep her fucking mouth shut. It was at this point that Billy Green who had been out in the parking lot during all of this walked up to the boys and told them this isn't the place to be doing this and to get their asses back into the car. So the police gathered this information and they spoke with both of the Green sons, Chad and Jason, as well as the father and mother. And while Chad and Jason admitted that they knew the victims, they stated that they had not been close. And Billy stated that he only knew the Elliott family peripherally. However, the mother, Mary, stated that the families had been close and that she never heard Chad talk about the murders, which she found odd given how close Carl and Chad had seemed to be. So while the police had very strong suspicions that the Greens had in fact committed the murders on the Elliott family. They didn't have any concrete proof because most of the people in the family were unwilling to talk. A number of members of the family did state to police, however, that they had been told should they ever mention the Elliott murders, they would quote-unquote get hurt. Because of all of this information, the police were able to get search warrants for the family's various holdings, including Jason Green's 1975 Cadillac. And inside of this car, police discovered a number of 22 caliber shell casings similar to the type that had been used to kill Carl Elliott. They also discovered bloody clothing in a trailer. Despite all of this evidence, they were unable to proceed with an arrest. Despite all of this, however, they were unable to move forward, and the case went cold. On September 7, 2000, a turkey hunter was trespassing on the land of a man known by locals to have threatened to shoot any trespassers he encountered. This was near Warm Springs, Arkansas, which was the home of the Green family. As this man made his way cautiously 
through the woods on this piece of property, he came upon a creek bed, and on this creek bed, he discovered human bones sticking out of the dirt. This has been variously reported as just a scattering of bones, but the main narrative is that he found a human skull along with a few of other bones. Knowing that there could be repercussions if he reported this to the police, the man was struck with a dilemma, but eventually his conscience won out, and he did in fact contact the police who went to the area the man had described and collected the skull uh, along with the other bone fragments. The bones were sent off for testing, and it was soon found that the skull belonged to Felicia. It was also noted that the discovery of her remains was less than a mile from the home of Billy Green. The police began interviewing individuals who knew the Greens in earnest at this point, and one of those individuals who was interviewed was Chad Green's girlfriend, Bonnie Hensley, who at the time was working at a, as a waitress at Archer's Cafe in Ravenden. She stated that on the morning of July 30th, Chad had called her while she was at work stating that he needed a ride to her house. So Hensley left work and went and picked up Chad from his house. Interestingly, Chad insisted that they avoid driving through Dalton. She noticed that he was wearing a pair of camouflaged overalls, and when he took them off, he was wearing a pair of bloody shorts. His body was covered in scratches and other wounds. And when pressed about these injuries, Chad told Bonnie that he had been involved in a fight with his brother the previous day. Hensley gave the article of clothing these bloody pair of shorts to the police when they spoke with her. And upon testing, it was learned that the short, the blood belonged to Chad and another unknown individual. Despite all of this evidence, though, they did not have enough to go on to arrest the men as well as put them on trial. That was until Mary Green decided that she could no longer keep her silence and decided to tell the police the truth about what had happened. Initially, she stated that both her husband and son were at home at the time of the murders. According to Mary, at some point in 2000, Billy confided in her that Chad had committed the murders and that on the night that they took place, he had gone out with Chad to help him clean up the mess that he had created, and that neither of them were in fact home when the murders took place. On July 30th of 2003, police arrested Billy, Chad, and Jason Green, charging them with the murders of the Elliott family, which they said arose from a drug deal gone bad. Carl's sister had informed the police that he had in fact stolen marijuana plants from the Green family, but that this theft took place in 1994 when Carl and one of his nephews, Shane Martin, had gone and stolen 10 plants from the family. Carl's sister speculated that 
this is what led to their murders as her nephew Shane died under mysterious circumstances not long after that and she believed that the killing that took place in 1998 was further retribution for the theft which let's be honest they kill if they kill one individual right after it happens they're not going to wait you know four years before taking out the other individual even if you suppose that not everybody in the green family knew that Carl was involved in the theft if somebody knew about it they probably would have gone after him right away instead of being buddy buddy with him for the next four years before killing him this idea was eventually dropped by the prosecution and even though they said it was a drug deal gone bad they came to believe that it was retribution for some other transgression involving drugs not the theft from 1994 now there are a couple of different versions as to how the actual murders went down and I'm going to go over them real quickly before I get into it however I want to warn everyone that there is some talk of extremely horrific child sexual abuse in these stories so if that's not something you really want to hear about you might want to skip ahead a couple of minutes until I get done talking about them. One theory holds that Chad and his father went over to the Elliot household on that evening and Chad went up to the house to get Carl to come down and help them with this supposedly broken down car at which point Billy got out of the car and shot Carl before the two of them proceeded to go up to the house murder Gregory beat Lisa and then took Felicia at which point they either murdered the girl immediately away from the house or else they took turns raping her before killing her another theory has it that Chad went to the house himself and there his car really did break down and that he went up to the house and got Carl that he had taken the 22 rifle that he was wanting to carry around with him to scare people and in an effort to try and scare Carl he shot the gun at him but accidentally hit him and believing that he was dead he walked up and shot him again Evidence does not bear out, however, the idea that it was an accidental shooting as Carl was shot twice in the head. Chad then drove up to the house in Carl's car and took a tire iron from the trunk. The family inside, believing that Carl had come home, did not understand the danger that was heading their way and Gregory ran up to the door expecting to see his father only for Chad to burst through and bash him in the head with the tire iron at which point he took the device jammed it through the boy's throat and ripped out his trachea before going into the kitchen and assaulting Lisa which was the domestic disturbance that Lisa's father and stepmother heard through the intercom. After doing this, Chad then went into the bedroom with the intention of taking Felicia for his own sick desires. He dropped the tire iron in her bedroom, and Lisa was either hiding under the covers on her bed or underneath the bed, Chad grabbed her, wrapped her in a blanket, and walked her out to the car, placing her in the trunk. At this point, he noticed that Lisa was not, in fact, dead. She had crawled out the 
kitchen window and dragged herself up to the trailer behind the house. And as she was banging on the door with her hands, Chad rushed up and slit her throat with a knife. Afterwards, Chad went back down the road to where his car was parked, took Felicia out, placed her inside the trunk of his own car and called his father, who came out and helped him dispose of the body of Carl. After this, Chad drove out into the woods and got his car stuck in mud, at which point he took Felicia out into the woods where he raped her before slitting her throat and stood there watching her bleed to death. The third theory is very similar to the second up until the point that Chad gets stuck in the woods and this is the really really graphic one. Apparently Chad took Felicia out into the woods and raped her before bringing her back to the car which he was able to get unstuck. After this he drove back to his house and placed Felicia inside of a 55 gallon drum where he kept her tied up for an unknown period of time taking her out whenever he felt the urge to have sex with her. Keep in mind, this was Arkansas in the late summer, and the days were routinely over 100 degrees, so you have this young girl stuck inside of this barrel with a lid on it all day long, being repeatedly sexually assaulted by this man. And there is evidence to support this particular theory. Unfortunately, the police did find a barrel at Chad's home, and they also found traces of his and another unidentified individual's DNA in this barrel. According to this story, Felicia was unknown to Billy, and when Billy found out about her still being alive and that his son was keeping her as a sex slave, he either committed the murder himself or ordered his son to do it in order to get rid of evidence, at which point Felicia was taken out to this stretch of land where the creek bed was and her throat was slit. At the first trial, police believed that Billy Green was the mastermind of the murders, and they sought the death penalty against him, and they had a lot of help on their side in that numerous members of the Green household agreed to testify against him, including Chad Green, who was painted as the pros- by the prosecution as an unwilling who had been forced to carry out his father's murderous rampage under the threat of his own death. Because of this, the state offered Chad Green a deal in wherein he got 40 years, I believe, for testifying against his father. And he, in fact, did testify against his father and Billy Green was found guilty. However, this was not the end of the case. Before we move to it, I know people are wondering you know, how he was able to get 40 years for a you know, quadruple homicide. Chad was not being charged with the homicides. That 40 years was for an unrelated sexual assault case. A cousin of his had contacted the authorities and stated that he had forced her to have sex with the girl when she was eight years old, and he continued this over the course of a few years, usually in the back of a broken-down car in an old barn 
of the property owned by the Green family. I'm not going to get into the details of the young woman's sexual assault, but it was horrific to say the least. With this all hanging over his head, Chad did agree to testify. He got the 40 years. However, in March of 2006, the Arkansas Supreme Court overturned Billy Green's sentence. They did this on the basis that the judge, a man by the name of Irwin, had erred when he allowed six witnesses to testify in the case. The reason that these six individuals should not have been allowed to testify during the case is that they had told the jury about crimes unrelated to the murders. With Carl Elliott's sister's testimony about how her nephew had been murdered for stealing the marijuana plants being the specific testimony cited as the reason to overturn it. The prosecutors, however, were not willing to let Billy Green walk free, and they immediately declared that they were going to charge him with the murders again. There was just one hiccup. Shad Green decided that he was no longer willing to cooperate with authorities and would not, in fact, be testifying against his father. Because of this, the prosecutor decided that not only would they be retrying Billy Green, but in fact they were going to try Chad for the murders as well. Something that Chad's defense team contested vehemently saying that it was double jeopardy. However, the state Supreme Court ruled that this was not the case as Chad was not living up to his end of the plea deal that he had entered into with the state back in 2004. Breaking this plea deal had voided his original term, meaning that it no longer was in existence. According to people who were present in the courthouse during these trials, neither Chad nor his father seemed to show any emotion when pictures of the crime scene were shown and descriptions of the manner of death were discussed. See, I skipped over some stuff. The Elliot son, Gregory, he had been hit once with the tire iron with one of the medical examiners stating that the blow was hard enough that it crushed his head like an egg but it was the ripping out of his trachea that actually killed him because unfortunately the young boy drowned to death on his own blood and while looking at these photographs which were shown to members of the jury and those gathered in the court as People in the jury box wept openly, the witnesses cried, people in the gallery cried, both Chad and his father sat there unflinchingly. The story that eventually came out during this case, this trial I should say, is that Billy himself had carried out the murders, including the taking of Felicia and placing her in the barrel, but that on the night of the murders, he had actually contacted his father, telling him, look, I got an issue that needs to get be taken care of, I need your help with this, at which point, Billy Green left the house, and his wife sat there listening to the police scanner that they had, why would they have a police scanner, you ha- ask? Well, remember, this family was very heavily involved in drug trafficking, and Billy used this in order to keep tabs on the police for when a shipment was going through. So Mary Green actually heard the call go out for the welfare check at the Elliott household, and by her estimation, she believed 
that her husband had enough time to drive to the Elliot household, do whatever part of the crime that he had done, and then get back to the house. However, she believed that her husband actually took part in the murders. When his mother was testifying, it should be noted that Chad Green did in fact cry, and I have to imagine he was crying not so much because of what he had done, but because he knew that he was going to pay the price for this. Which you'll see a lot in these types of cases, where a psychotic will break down in tears, and many people think it's because they feel remorse over what for what they have done, but the reality is it's they're crying over the fact that they are going to lose their freedom and be held accountable for their actions. During Chad's trial, the prosecution had a surprise witness in his girlfriend, Bonnie, and apparently when she came out to take the stand, Chad looked as though somebody had punched him in the stomach and knocked all the winds out of his lungs. She related the story of how she had gone to pick him up when he demanded it and then seen him in the bloody underwear or shorts. I'm uncertain as to which it actually was, but she had been given these or had taken them and then later gave them to police. She also testified that Chad instructed her to lie about his whereabouts that evening. Bonnie further went on to state that when she was 14 years old, she had begun a sexual relationship with Chad's father, Billy, and that the two of them consumed drugs together, and that Billy had become enraged when Chad began dating the young girl, so much so that she avoided him whenever possible. Bonnie further recounted the toxic atmosphere of the Green household, how Billy would beat and manipulate his children and wife to do as he wanted them to. This, too, was a portion of the trial where Chad was seen to be openly weeping. Again, I have to believe it's not because of the fact that of what was done to him so much as the fact that he realized that he was going to be found guilty, and Chad was found guilty. But before that happened, the police had a jailhouse informant who testified. This individual was serving a lengthy prison sentence. However, the things he told both the jury and the courtroom were enough that after his testimony, wearing his prison uniform and shackled, members of the Elliott family came up and thanked the man for testifying. So this prisoner, Alfonso Price Brown, had been serving prison time with Chad Elliott, and they ended up becoming friends while in prison. And according to Brown, eventually Chad told him that he had killed the Elliott family by himself because Carl had owed drug money to Billy. And Billy had been really getting on his case about getting the money back from Carl. On the stand, when discussing Felicia, Brown stated that, quote-unquote, he said he wanted to enjoy her. She was going to die anyway. Obviously, this particular bit of testimony had a heavy impact on the jury, particularly when you take into the account the fact that the young girl was believed to have been held in a barrel for an unknown period of time. The defense portion of the trial basically came across that Chad was 
mentally challenged and damaged by years of his father's abuse and that he had simply gone along with his father's demands and that Billy himself had actually carried out the murders. However, that notwithstanding, the jury eventually returned a guilty verdict uh, for Chad. He was found guilty of four counts of murder in the first and sentenced to four consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole as well as to 58 years for the sexual assault of his cousin. Billy Green was tried in a separate trial and apparently it almost did not happen as it was learned just prior to its beginning that Chad Green had admitted to his first trial attorney that he had committed the murders himself while high on methamphetamine. This supposed confession is where the second theory about the murders actually comes from. However, the trial did proceed and it began in May of 2012. Much like at Chad's trial, a jailhouse informant came forward and stated that Billy Green had confided in him that he and his sons had committed the murders and that afterward the two men took turns raping Alicia over the course of a number of days. This includes placing her into the barrel. Supposedly, according to this jailhouse Foreman, Chad fell in love with the little girl and balked when his father came and stated that she needed to die and that Billy himself had been the one who committed the deed. This jailhouse informant further went on to state that the reason for the murders had nothing to do with drugs but that just Prior to the murders taking place, Lisa Elliott had learned that Chad had already, in fact, begun molesting Felicia. This was further backed up by stories that had been circulating in the area for years about drug-fueled parties involving the two families, at which time Chad is supposed to have sexually assaulted Felicia with the knowledge of her parents, although I find that highly unlikely that they were doing that. But there have been new how many cases out there where a parent who is hooked on drugs allows the dealer to sexually assault their children uh, in exchange for drugs. So while I find it unlikely, that's not to say it couldn't have happened, because we have evidence that it has many, many times. Once again, Mary Green took the stand, and this time she did everything that she could in order to paint her husband as the main perpetrator of the crimes. This was probably an attempt to get the man the death penalty, which isn't surprising considering the years of physical and emotional abuse she had suffered. Other family members took the tri- stand at the trial before Billy Green himself took the stand, which, if you know anything about true crime, it's never a good idea to take the stand in your own trial. Uh, I don't have statistics, but I'd be willing to bet that the amount of people who are found guilty after taking the stand in their own trial is probably well above 90%. According to Billy, he had nothing to do with the murders, although he believed his son had, and the day that Carl's body was found, supposedly Chad had to his father what he had done, at which point Billy had taken it upon himself to keep the knowledge to himself and do whatever it was he could do in order to keep his son from going to prison. 
not surprisingly, Billy Green was found guilty on four counts of murder, and much like his son, sentenced to four consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. Both men are currently incarcerated in the Arkansas Department of Corrections. And one side note to this story, a little bit of light in this dark, twisted tale, Billy Crean decided that he was going to represent himself in his appeals and fired his attorney. He was given X amount of days to provide various documents to the court for his appeals, and he failed to do it. So now, despite how much he may claim his innocence, Billy will really never see the light of day because he has lost his ability to appeal the case, which I think is only fitting. As to my own thoughts on what happened, I think it very likely that Chad Green committed the murders himself and called his father to come help him get rid of Carl Elliott's body after the fact. I don't think Billy initially knew that the girl was still alive on that evening, but I believe he found out about it not long after. He may have walked in on his son in the middle of raping the young girl, and he probably partook of it himself, as we know that he, at the very least, did have a sexual relationship with a 14-year-old. I find it very unlikely that Chad, you know, quote-unquote, fell in love with Felicia. Um, Individuals like him, who I believe to be a psychopath, are incapable of love, I think it was more to the point that he saw her as his personal property and object that he owned, and he very well probably did balk at the idea of having to kill her, but his father insisted, and because of this, I believe Chad probably went out into the woods and killed her himself. After which point, both father and son conspired to keep their involvement in the murders a secret. I don't think that it was the murders were fueled by lust for the young girl. I think she was just an innocent bystander. Collateral damage, so to speak. I think it more likely that Carl did in fact owe them money for drugs and they eventually just got sick and tired of waiting, or at least Chad did, and he decided to take the money out on their lives. That is it for the Death Cast this week. Again, I am your host, best-selling author, Ian Todd. Thank you for coming with me this week as we headed into the wilds of Arkansas to look at a truly horrific case. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. If you use Podcast Addict or Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. Share it on social media. If you're interested in reading any of my five novels, that's Blood Gods Trilogy, The House of Silver Doors, or The Throwaway Girls of Olympia, they can be found on my website, CorpseCreekPublishing.com, on Amazon, where they are available in both paperback and Kindle versions, with The House of Silver Doors also being available on Audible. You can also find them at Barnes & Noble or any of your local book retailers. Just ask for books by Ian Totten. If they do not have them in stock, they can order them. Until next week, stay morbid.
the dead guys.